Thank you, JP. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the international debates that are happening at the UN and how uh, civil society can get involved in those debates, but also, most importantly, why civil society should get involved in those debates. Um, yeah, my name's Jamie Bridge. I work for the International Drug Policy Consortium, um, but I'm also chair of the Vienna NGO Committee and the co-chair of the Civil Society Task Force, which is something I'll, uh, I'm actually going to introduce in my presentation today. So when we talk about the UN debates on drugs, we're really talking about this soulless, windowless room in Vienna. Uh, this is the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs. This is where the member states, where the governments from the world gather together and debate around drugs. This is the main policy-making forum on drugs within the UN system. It's not where all the debates happen, but it's where most of them happen, and it's, it's, it's what I'm going to talk most about today. So this is a very quick schematic of the last few decades of drug policy debates in the CND in Vienna. It all starts with the, the actual drug conventions themselves. We currently have three drug conventions. They were agreed in 61, 71, and 88. And then the governments then got themselves into this kind of 10-year cycle of creating new political declarations and new commitments on drugs. Um, and that took us up to 2009, where we had a high-level meeting uh, in Vienna um, to adopt a political declaration on drugs. And that's a 10-year plan of action, a 10-year strategy on drugs. And the goal of that strategy, the target, was to eliminate or significantly reduce drug markets by 2019. So we've got six weeks left to eliminate drugs and have a drug-free world. It's either going to be the most incredible six weeks in the history of the world, or we're not going to get there. Um, but that's the target they set themselves, and that's why 2019 is an important year, because it's the year by which that target is supposed to be achieved. But what happened in the meantime was the governments of Mexico and Guatemala and Colombia, they said that we can't wait till 2019 to have, to have a conversation about drugs. And they actually asked for the, the, the General Assembly to have a special session on drugs earlier. And it ended up happening in 2016, so just a few years ago. And so instead of that soulless, windowless room in Vienna, we all went to this windowless but much prettier room in New York. And this is the General Assembly, where the governments again came together, had a really high-level discussion about the future of, of drug policy. And at that forum, they made a lot of progress. I mean, the UNGAS outcome document, which is uh, the document here on, on the left-hand side, it represented the latest kind of commitment, the latest kind of agreement between governments on how to deal with drugs. But it was... It was better than the ones we've had before because it included a special focus on access to medicines, which is something that we've never really had before, a special focus on alternative development, special focus on human rights. Uh, it also mentioned uh, certain harm reduction interventions for the first ever time, like naloxone and needle and syringe programs. So it really was a kind of step, albeit you know, a tentative step, but it was a step in the right direction. And for this reason, like the young gas, I think, is a really important kind of uh, milestone for us um, in the drug policy debate. But that kind of leaves us with a bit of a strange situation, because that meeting was supposed to happen in 2019. That was supposed to be the meeting where we came together and agreed the next 10-year plan or the next political declaration. But it's already happened. So they had to agree, we have to do, they had to do something in 2019 because that, that, as I said, was the target date. So instead, they're going to have a, a ministerial segment, a high-level meeting in Vienna next March uh, at the CND. And it's with this in mind that we're currently working with, the, with other civil society partners to try and make sure that civil society has as strong a voice as possible in this debate because potentially they are going to agree what the next decade of drug policy looks like uh, as an international community. So we created the Civil Society Task Force. Um, this was originally created before the UNGAS in New York, before the General Assembly Special Session. 
Um, and it had a real impact on the young gas. It really helped to ensure that, I think, for those of you who were there in New York, the civil society presence at that meeting was probably the strongest it's ever been at this level of the debate. We were visible, we were loud, uh, we had an impact on the proceedings, we had presentations, we had civil society speakers from all around the world. It was a kind of really key moment in terms of uh, how seriously civil society were taken. So we wanted to recreate that and continue that good work with uh, the Civil Society Task Force. It's a joint initiative of the two NGO committees that exist, one in Vienna and one in New York. And its basic mission is to promote the involvement of civil society in these discussions. But crucially, unlike IDPC, for example, where all our members align to a certain position on drugs, the Civil Society Task Force is there to represent all of civil society. So that includes harm reduction networks, but it also includes prevention groups, abstinence-based groups, treatment organizations, uh, access to justice groups. We really, the task force is designed to represent the entire spectrum of views that exist. And that can be a real challenge, but it's also the strength of the task force because, because it's so, because the spectrum of, of views is so broad, it's much easier for us to argue to have the space for civil society to be heard. So these are the members of the task force. There's 35 members. You might recognize some of those faces, and I know some of them are actually here at the conference this week. Um, you have two representatives from each region of the world. You have some representatives of the affected populations, which includes people who use drugs, but also youth, women, etc. And it includes representatives for what we call global issues, such as harm reduction, prevention, treatment, access to medicines, and criminal justice. So everyone in this group, they're not representing themselves, they're not representing their own organization, they are representing civil society from their region or from their group. Um, and that's, that's why it's important to kind of be familiar with who your, who your representatives are, and I'll put some email addresses up on my last slide. So this task force has been working hard for the last year. There's been a series of meetings in Vienna uh, where governments have been coming together, trying to work out what the hell they're gonna do because there's obviously not gonna be a drug-free world in six weeks' time. Um, so they've been coming together for these debates and at every debate that they've had, we have managed to secure civil society speakers, either people coming to Vienna, and in some cases we've been able to actually fund people to come to Vienna, or people submitting videos or written statements if they can't travel. But crucially, we've managed to secure the voice of civil society in these debates. And it's, it's really begun to have a, a bit of an, a, an impact on, on those debates itself. We, had, uh, we, we always put out an open call. So everything is, is always open, it's always put online, it's always transparent. We received more than 100 applications from NGOs to speak at these meetings, and we were able to pick you know, a balanced kind of uh, list of speakers in the end. Uh, Peter Sorosi was one of our speakers uh, a couple of weeks ago in Vienna, um, and Harm Reduction International and others, and also uh, the Eurasian Harm Reduction Association have also spoken in these last few months. Throughout October, we also launched uh, an online consultation for civil society, which hopefully most of you have seen or have heard of at least. Um, we received about 500 responses, which, is, which is, we're really pleased with, and we're currently analyzing the results. And the, the results of that consultation, that will be the closest thing we've got to like a civil society position on drugs. That's why we've done that consultation. So those results will be launched in Vienna again uh, in a couple of weeks' time on the 5th of December. And then we will formally submit the report to the governments in the hope that it then influences the actual debates itself and influences the outcome of this meeting in 2019. And then in early 2019, we will also hold some civil society meetings. And these will be opportunities for civil society to come along. The audience will be the governments. The panelists will be civil society and it's our chance again to get our, our feet, our thoughts and our, our views across and to try and influence the debates. And when those hearings are confirmed, again, we'll select the speakers through an open call. So if you're interested in speaking at these debates, if you're interested in coming to the United Nations and talking to governments, please do uh, look up the Civil Society Task Force on social media. 
uh, follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook and all that stuff. Um, and as soon as there is an opportunity for people to speak, you'll be the first to hear about it. So with all of those efforts, the current situation in Vienna is actually pretty good for civil society. We've, we've seen a really big improvement over the last five to 10 years. Certainly, if you compare where we are now to where we were in 2009, when they agreed this 10-year declaration, we're in a much, much stronger position. We are widely acknowledged. We're widely accepted as being part of these meetings now, not just uh, some kind of outsiders. We can attend the meetings. Officially, we're listed as observers. Um, but we can attend uh, all the public elements of the meeting, we can speak in these sessions, we can organize side events, we can submit our contributions, and most importantly, we're, we're, we're being heard. You know, the, the United Nations, kind of similar to the EU and other international um, kind of structures, it does move slowly. And on drugs, the United Nations moves by consensus, so it's even slower than, than other parts. But we are seeing a real trend towards better responses, more humane responses, and the civil society involvement has been a really big part of that. But of course, there's lots of challenges remaining. A lot of governments do still remain very cautious about civil society, maybe even a little untrusting of civil society, um, particularly those governments that in their, you know, at home in their domestic situation there really isn't that role of civil society to be the critical friend of government. I think in Europe, that's a pretty well-established role that civil society plays. But in other parts of the world, that's actually something that's quite uncomfortable for some governments to uh, get used to. And at the same time, that role of being the critical friend is sometimes difficult with, you know, for the government to accept when it's them that's being criticised. Like They've always said to us they want to hear the voices from the ground. They want to hear from a treatment organisation in Tanzania or a harm reduction organisation in Romania or you know, some, some prevention organisation in Indonesia. They want to hear from the people on the ground. But when the people on the ground want to tell their story, it isn't always positive. And it is, it's a challenge for those governments to listen to a civil society speaker criticizing the way they do things at home. Governments don't like being embarrassed in front of their friends at the United Nations. They don't like that at all. And so that's always been a bit of a challenge that which we've constantly tried to address. And there's, there's diplomatic ways to, to, to make your point heard without standing up and saying, my government's corrupt, please sack them. You know, because that, that is just not gonna, that is not gonna go down well at the United Nations, no matter how true it might be. Um, because civil society is more visible at these meetings, we have seen in recent years that kind of more and more of the really important stuff is going on behind the closed doors. There are still these meetings, they call them informals. Um, and we're not, as observers, we're not allowed in those rooms. They're, they're closed meetings, unminuted, unrecorded. And that's really where, that's where the real stuff happens. Um, but we're seeing more and more negotiations happening behind the closed doors. And that's something that we need to keep challenging. But the way round that, and this is happening in a lot of uh, countries at the moment, um, the way round that is to get your government delegation to put someone from civil society on the government delegation. And that means there is no closed door. Once you're on a government delegation, you can go to, you are allowed in any room in this UN building. You have access to all areas. Um, and then there's the perpetual problems, and you'll all be very familiar with these, these uh, as relevant at the international level as they are at the national level. There's very little financial support for participation. The task force has managed to get some funding. Uh, we have uh, donations from Russia, from Sweden, from Germany, and from the Netherlands. And so that's enabled us to bring some people, but nowhere near enough. And there's also this lack of capacity. People don't understand what the United Nations is or why, you know, what, what's happening at the United Nations. And that's really the job of organizations like the Civil Society Task Force, but also like IDPC. That's our job to try and keep communicating those things. So this is my last slide, and in, it's kind of the most important one, because you know, what does this matter? Like, sometimes the United Nations debates can seem so disconnected from reality, and sometimes they are so disconnected from reality, You'd be forgiven for thinking, well, this doesn't affect me. Why would I, why would I waste my time traveling to Vienna in winter 
where it's freezing cold to go to this meeting and talk to governments who aren't going to listen anyway. But it, it does matter. These debates will set the tone for drug policy, the international drug policy for the next 10 years. And no matter what country you're from, the international policy does influence the national policy. And it does influence the regional policy. Almost every country has a drug law and a drug strategy that is based in some, to some extent on the international treaties and the international political declaration. So it really does matter. And if we can make progress at this level, then that progress can filter down to the national level where it really matters. We did make progress for the young gas, for the 2016 meeting in New York. We really did break through on some of those issues. Like I say, for the first time, we now have the global, the United Nations saying that every country must provide naloxone. That's now written in, written in stone at the United Nations. We have other, you know, we've got a stronger language than we've ever had before about access to medicines, access to opiates for pain relief, human rights obligations. So we really have made progress, and I think it's really important now because we're seeing some governments try to maybe step back from that a little bit. You know, the world, even since 2016, the world's become an even more kind of right-wing populist place. And we are seeing that in, it, that, that is having an impact in Vienna as well. So a lot of what we've got to try and do in 2019 is to protect the advances that we've made and make sure that we don't accidentally slide back, uh, you know, back to 2009 or even earlier. Um, but lastly, and by no means least, you know, the, it's, a, it's a real opportunity for you and for your NGO and for your community to have your voice heard by governments, by your own government, if they're there, but also by the international community. And we've seen the impact that this has had, and I hope it will continue to have an impact. And that's why, we, that's why we've created the Civil Society Task Force, to make sure that you have that opportunity to speak. So if you're interested in the task force or you just want to find out a bit more, please visit our website or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm one of the co-chairs. Please email me or, or I'm happy to answer questions. My fellow co-chair is from the New York committee, a lady called Heather Haas. And again, that's her email up there. Um, there are representatives for Europe, for Western Europe and for Eastern Europe, but crucially, there's also a representative for harm reduction. She couldn't be here, but her colleagues are here from Harm Reduction International. Sam's gonna present uh, after me. Um, her name's Olga, and again, she is there to represent the harm reduction community. So please don't hesitate to bother her. Don't hesitate to tell her that I told you to bother her. And uh, yeah, she's there to represent you guys and to, to help, again, make sure your voices are heard. So thank you very much.